Uh, well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Scott, good to meet you. Good to meet you as well. Uh, huge congrats on, on what we're going to talk about, which is the 20th anniversary of Pitch Black with the super duper Arrow release that's coming out. And uh, can, you, can you believe it's been, it's been 20 years since, since the first movie? Because it, it feels like it's uh, very, very current given the sequels and everything else. But, but 20 years, I mean, how does that feel to you as a filmmaker to talk about a movie 20 years later? You know, it's just about enough time where I can look at the movie again <clears throat> with something that resembles fresh eyes. Meaning, it's like, I'm not one who's big on looking at my movies. If I'm channel surfing at night I, and one's on, I'll look at it for five minutes and then you know, I'm off to something else, right? Because I don't want to relive all the mistakes and all the pain of production. <clears throat> so, so to sit down with Pitch Black and see it again while we regraded it, we recolor timed it, and uh, you know checked for did the uh, quality control checks. It was just enough time where I could sit back and kind of enjoy the movie as a movie, rather than a recitation of all the pain and suffering we endured while we were making the movie in the outback of Australia. So I was actually able to. Even though my eye still goes to the problem areas, the problem areas that I never got right. Now, at the end of the process of um, color timing the, uh, the new master, I sat back and I said, you know what? It's a pretty good movie, which is sort of high praise for me because I'm always super critical of my own work. <laughs> yeah, 20 years. I mean, it must be, it must be a, strange, a strange feeling because you know, there's a lot of filmmakers that get to, to do these remasters and... Uh, I'm talking to some people to do a Flash Gordon because that's 40 years this year. And they were saying about how technology's come. Wait, wait, Flash or Flesh? Flash Gordon. Uh, Flash Gordon, that would be, that, yeah, that's a very different movie. <laughs> but about, you know. I was lined up in the theater watching that. <laughs> um, about how, you know, like you say, going in with fresh eyes and seeing not just what you went through at the time, but then seeing it this fresh perspective and given this new technology that, that you get to maybe make it in a way with it, like you said, with the color correction and the 4K and all that kind of stuff, make it even better in some respects. But I mean, how did this start for you? How did Pitch Black start for you? Because uh, forgive me if this is incorrect, but this this ties in a little bit to you and Alien 3, is that correct? Or is that is that kind of very, is that like fan fiction well, as it were? It doesn't, they don't tie into each other really. I mean, I did do a pass on Alien 3 um, when the for Fox, if so, the two separate stories. Here's here's the Alien story. You can, Alien Three. All I did was write maybe a draft or draft and a half of that when the studio Fox wanted to do it without the Ripley character. They didn't want to be beholden to that character, and they didn't want to base on the character, and they didn't know if Sigourney was going to be coming back all that kind of stuff. And so I said, fine, I'll write one without. Um, so I replaced uh, her with a male lead. Everyone seemed to like it, but then change of um, leadership of the studio, new guy comes in and he says, I'm not going to make this without Sigourney Weaver. So we have a script that everybody wants to do, likes, is ready to go. Now we got to figure out how to incorporate Sigourney. So I said, all right, I'll go. All right, I have some ideas about how to, how to uh, gender switch the, uh, the male lead into and create into Ripley. Um, so I went out to New York and I sat with uh, Sigourney and talked her through it. And um, she got on board. So I flew back to Los Angeles and said, okay, I think I see a way and I think your actress is on board. So let me write that version. So I did do another pass. Oh, here's what, here's what happened. And it's treacherous, man. So about this, so I start to write a pass converting uh, the, my male lead into uh, Ripley with a lot of modifications to make that work. At the same time, they, hire, they start to hire a director, uh, Vincent Ward, whose work I really liked, New Zealand director. I thought he'd be great. But then as I'm like trying to put the, I'm about two thirds way through my second draft, the Ripley centric draft, I hear rumors that the director is off writing his version of the script while I'm writing my version of the script. And that's technically okay from a writer's guild standpoint, but the studio is supposed to let you know that there are other writers on the same project at the same time and they never told me that. I had to call them up. 
studio and say, what the fuck is going on with this project? And they gave me this, this total bullshit about, oh, the director is not writing Alien 3, the director is writing Alien 4. I said, but he's directing Alien 3, is that correct? Yes. I said, I don't believe that for a second. So, so I basically just slapped it together, sent it to the studio and said, pay me. Uh, and that was the end of my tenure on Alien 3. So Vincent Ward went off and did Monks in Space. Then they realized they didn't like Vincent Ward, that maybe he was a little too much of a handful. And uh, they fired him. <laughs> so it's like they're in total chaos at this point. But they've got their actors on. So, so you know, that's when Walter Hill and David Geiler step back in and they try to pull it together. And, and, uh, and then Fincher. So, and you see echoes of... Uh, you see echoes of Monks in Space. It is Monks in Space still, but in a very different way than I think what uh, Vincent had in mind. So it was a troubled, uh, chaotic relationship from the start. But you know, a chaotic relationship doesn't, a chaotic start to production doesn't mean, or even a chaotic production doesn't mean that you're gonna make a bad movie. You know, Casablanca was a chaotic production. Mm. Apocalypse Now was a chaotic production as well. <laughs> oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, uh, and every Terry Gilliam movie. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. So in terms of your, because I read this is this was on like an IMDb trivia thing. I don't know if it was true. So it said that, that your kind of ideas from that transported to Pitch Black, but was it more kind of the, the character more than anything with Pitch Black? And did that, did it, or was it just completely that you wrote an Alien Free Draft, that was it, and then Pitch Black was an idea that you had afterwards or... No, there, there may be a sequence in it. There may be something in the escape sequence that I wrote. I, look, I'm trying, now you're taking me back even more than 20 years, right? <laughs> so I'm trying to remember. And I've written a lot of fucking scripts since then. <laughs> so <you> have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, when I, you know, when I set it aside, when I found out the, uh, the, the studio was doing me dirty, and I, you know, I don't even think about it anymore. It's, it's fucking gone. Um, I think there might be some echoes of an escape sequence in the Alien 3 script that uh, are evidence in perhaps the second movie, Chronicles, really. Right, okay. Sort of a across the world escape from a prison facility. But other than that, no. Other than that, no, I don't, I don't see much in Pitch Black, to tell the truth. So in terms of Pitch Black then, I mean, obviously, you, you touched one there about the you shot it in I know you shot it in South Australia I believe in the outback and you had 20 30 million dollar budget or whatever so in terms of in terms of looking back at the film now and in your experience on it how did you find the experience because in, in a minute I'm going to ask you about going from well I'll ask you it now going from a 20 30 million dollar budget on Pitch Black to then when you did the sequel which was a huge huge budget did you prefer doing the smaller budget even though there were problems or did you prefer the bigger budget even though there may or may not have been problems on that as well yeah pitch black was like a 21 million dollar movie maybe 22 by the time we finished and then the second one uh, was a big studio movie uh at 105 and then third movie we made independently and financed it ourselves and that was probably 36 37 38 right around there so, you know, it's, we're all over the place in terms of budget and, and um, ambition. The question was, is it a big, uh, is it a big, look, uh, Pitch Black was effective for what it, what it, what it was, and um, especially for its characters and the unexpected, I think, depth of characters for a genre of piece. Because we had a very genre setup, you know, which was, rather a, fam a familiar setup as well, which is, you know, people crash land on a planet and they have to fight for their survival. Uh, you know, we've seen that before. So I said, if we're gonna do that, then give me the script and let me, you know, let me do what I, what I want to do with the characters, which is to do all these reversals of expectations, which is, you know, the John's character, here's the classic hero, square jawed guy. He's got a cute dimple in his chin. Uh, he's got the shiny badge. So he's going to be the guy who's going to lead us through this and he's going to win the girl in the end. And, you know, that's the expectation. I said, if that is the expectation, <laughs> what are we going to do? What are we really going to do? So let's turn him into a morphine freak and let's turn him into a coward and let's have him be willing to kill the kid to save his own skin when things get, when the going gets tough. And then, 
that guy who you've had locked up the whole time, you know, that badass serial killer. Well, as far as I can tell, he really hasn't killed anybody in the course of the movie. So why are we scared of him? And could he ever be the savior of this movie, right? So I said, that's what I want to do with that character. And then the Fry character, played by uh, Rada Mitchell, uh, you know, she's posing as the captain of the ship, but she's really not the captain of the ship. And by the way, she was willing to kill everybody in the opening sequence. So she may be the greatest serial killer of them all, right? But she may be the true serial killer here. <laughs> yeah. So I love all those uh, reversals of expectations and just doing what you don't expect. And, um, and I think that's what elevated the movie, to tell the truth. It really wasn't the production value. We were just too strapped uh, too many times. So, you know, we made 20 million bucks go a long way, uh, no doubt. So the original question was what it was like stepping up to a, a big budget. Well, you know, the difference is that you've got to, instead of an R-rated movie, then suddenly you're spending that much money. The studio says, you must be a PG-13. There's no arguing it. Unless you want to cut $30 million out of your budget right now. And then suddenly all those great sequences that you had imagined, you know, of armies invading and, and the troop carriers bowing to the Lord Marshal and all those all those great promenade sequences that we had, all those be whisked away and many, many more. Then suddenly, okay, we're a PG-13, right? Just so you can carry out the vision that you've already scripted and boarded <clears throat> and started, and started uh, pre-production on. So um, that was the change of attitude. And then the studio has a lot of input, you know, along the way they have input into the script, they have input into editing and all those things. And as is, a reaction, if not an overreaction, to that filmmaking um, um, effort, we uh, we decided to make the third movie ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I think I was going to say to you actually that was one of my questions about Pitch Black. In that, it, it, I think the reason why I like it so much is because you—that's what exactly what you did with the Riddick character, particularly. You think, oh, he's the he's going to be the bad guy, this and that, and then all of a sudden, it twists on itself. And I think that gave it such a great freshness. Because yeah. even though, this, as you say, the, the kind of sci-fi stuff is the, is the kind of skin of it, but underneath it is this fantastic kind of reversal of, of roles that, that Vin is fantastic in. As you say, Rada Mitchell, I was going to mention her because she's fantastic in the movie as well. And it was something that it has nothing to do with this, but I think one of the reasons why people were so enamored with Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight in that it took the superhero genre, but it twisted it on its head and kind of mm. changed things. And I just wondered for you as a writing uh, you know, because obviously not not so much the alien thing. But I just wondered how how much fun that was to write, knowing that even though you didn't have all the money in the world, that you were going to do something that was at least going to be very different and allow people to go. Oh, actually, this isn't what I anticipated. Yeah, that was the expectation. I think we uh, executed on that, or that that was our ambition in the beginning. Um, if we're going to do something that appears to be such a straight genre piece, you better get it going there, and you better surprise your audience. You know delightfully surprised them hopefully i think we even surprised them with the uh the character of the of um, the jack character who's uh, a female posing as a male you know and then suddenly you're out in the wilderness with her and she says oh by the way you know not only am i female but <clears throat> i'm on my period too and these things go off blood oh thank you for telling us now thank you for telling us now so, <laughs> So, you know, just those kinds of things that we took some chances with the script, yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, obviously, you're obviously work with Vin now on three of the movies. Uh, you seem to have a great rapport with him, both as to, in terms of friendship, but also a working relationship. I mean, that must be one of the great kind of things that you've taken away from the series and that you've, you've been able to work with Vin and you've become involved together to bring Riddick you know, obviously you made a big, you made Pitch Black, then you make a big movie and then you've made it independently because you wanted to kind of stay true to what you guys wanted to make. But to have someone like him must have been great to be able to go and do that because you had, say, a supporter and a, and a colleague, if you like, to know that this character, there's a richness to this character that people would like to see more of. Yeah, and, and you know, I must say that Vin sort of saw that before I did as well because when I'm shooting Pitch Black, I'm just trying to, you know, I'm trying to make my day. I'm trying, and I'm trying to catch up to, um, a shooting schedule that was, a, um, you know, I was actually falling behind because we were in Cooperpedia, we were in the Outback, and it was it was raining instead of bright and arid, and and you know we had all kinds of problems. So I found myself two weeks behind, uh, one week behind production, two weeks into the schedule, which is a bad place for any director to be, right? Especially a new director who you know, who can be replaced. 
So uh, I'm just trying to make my day um, every day on Pitch Black. But Vin, I think even before I did, um, was saying, hey, was thinking to himself <laughs> and saying to me that there's other things we can do with this character. You know, it, it, we can go places with this character. Because originally it was supposed to be a three-hander. It was an equal three-hander between the Fry character, the Riddick character, and the Johns character. But as we started um, testing the film, people were really responding to the Riddick character. So we um, front loaded the movie with a VO that is the voiceover that is now in the movie, starting with Riddick's perspective. And so we sort of, in the editing process, we made him a first among equals. When that became apparent that the audience was digging this guy. And then Vin and I decided later on with other movies that it's, we don't have to necessarily be a horror movie anymore if we follow Riddick. It is a, it is a Chronicles Riddick movie if it follows this character to any world. And, um, he can meet up with any circumstances. He can meet up with any enemy as long as we're following him. It's a, it's a Chronicles Riddick movie. So, so the, you know, the, we did switch genres in the second movie too. We went for a sort of mythic adventure rather than sci-fi horror. And you know, some people went along for that ride, some didn't. And then with the third one, we went back to sort of a survival Jeremiah Johnson movie. Yeah, and um, adventure as well sci-fi as well but we uh we mix up the genres every time out i don't know that there's another franchise that is willing to take that chance yeah for sure in terms of the pitch black then i mean what are you obviously you've seen it again a few times since you know and obviously for the for the blu-ray release you've seen it a few more times i mean what's the what's the kind of thing you're most proud about the kind of the end result of pitch black what's the thing that all through the work and all through the, the the schedule and everything else what's the thing you're kind of most proudest about that you managed to you managed to do with the movie well technically and i don't know if your audience is interested in technical stuff well I'm proud that i was able well i'll tell you what i'm proud that i was really able to launch my career that i was really able to launch vin's career right um or help launch his career he had done private ryan i think at the time but i'm proud of helping him launch his career, his career and helping him continue this, um, this journey that we are both on. From a, from a technical standpoint, I'm proud of the, the chances that we took. We used this, um, we were shooting on film back in the day, pre-digital, and we did a skip bleach process on the original camera negative, which people were saying you really can't do because you can't, you can't fuck with the negative like that. That's, that's everything, right? But we did it anyway, and it's a special process that you do at the laboratory, and it's um, um, thought to be irreversible. But it's the, it's the, it gave us the look for those daytime sequences. You know, when you see those highlights on people's heads bloom, and they, it's a burnished look, that's because this process we did at the laboratory keeps the silver in the film rather than drops the silver out of the film. And then when you project the lights through that, that uh, um, uh, negative that has, um, uh, the silver retained in it, it spreads the light in a very desirable and, and hopefully otherworldly way. So those are some of the technical chances we were taking. And, you know, we, we were so, uh, you know, new to filmmaking that we, we were just embracing uh, chance taking. And um, that's one of the things I'm proud of. But that's, that's emblematic of some of, the, some of the other chances that we took along the way, including just going out to like the Outback and expecting everything to be hot and arid and finding out it was <laughs> it was like muddy and overcast and <laughs> I think that is one of the things that for me as a fan I do love that I think a lot of people love the effect that you've done I never knew how you did it so I was going to ask you about that so I'm glad you've answered <laughs> that yeah. question for me um, today you would do it today you would just do it digitally as your color time in the film you dial those things in but back then you really had to affect the negative of the movie and uh, people get scared when you do that, you know, mm. the completion bond company and the producers, they get, they get nervous when you start messing with the negative. Ah, oh, I see. Yeah, it's a very, very good effect. I think it's very distinctive for the film. So it's, it's I, I think it's pretty cool myself. Mm. Uh, speaking of Vin, I did read that he'd said, I think earlier, maybe end of last year or early this year, I can't remember that there was a, there was a part four, a script had been written and that he'd, he'd read it. Uh, is that, is that part is that you? Is, 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 are you part of the process for a potential fourth movie or is it, is it that you're maybe talking about doing another one? Uh, we are, uh, yes, I am involved in that. I just finished the script uh, uh, three or four days ago. 
And I had uh, done treatments for Vin uh, in the past. So typically I just do a treatment, Vin looks at it, we talk about it, decide that this is the story we want to tell. And then I go off and, and write a screenplay. And I just finished that screenplay three, four days ago. Um, for lack of a better title, we're just calling it Riddick for colon Furia. We'll see if that sticks, we'll see if it changes. But um, yeah, the expectation is, Vin's loving it. So the expectation is that we can, uh, we'll pop it sometime in 2021. Fantastic, is that you directing as well or are you letting someone else have a go this time? <laughs> I'm the guy. You're the guy. That's exciting, it's very exciting. But I guess in terms of, uh, obviously, are you, uh, are you gonna be doing it the same way you did Riddick, the th obviously? part three are you going to be doing it yourselves as in you're going to be doing it independently from a from a studio system you want to try and keep it <clears throat> i think there is an obligation at this point to um see if universal wants to be involved because universal has distributed all three movies uh but they only financed the second movie somebody else financed the first movie and then in, we raised independent money to do the third movie so there's an obligation to see if they want to be involved uh, and to what extent? Ideally, you know, them distributing is a very good thing for us, right? Because they've got the machine, they've got the client. So at a minimum, that's what we would want them to do. So we'll see. Those negotiations will probably start next week. You know? Fantastic. And obviously it will be, I guess, when you start to shoot, it will be slightly a slightly different shooting dynamic than what you're, you have before given social distancing and everything else. But yeah, we're, we're all trying to understand how that may be possible. I don't think we can do what the soap operas are doing, which is like <laughs> when, when somebody goes in to kiss, to kiss somebody else, you're kissing a mannequin instead of a human being. I don't think we can get away with that in the film. So, yes, there will be, um, yeah, we, we're going to be moving slower because of the COVID-related Precautions. I know that. And that's going to drive up the cost of the movie, of, of not just our movie, but any movie. So I'm trying to figure all that out right now. But, you know, hopefully, hopefully by, you know, spring of next year, we'll be in a better place than we are here in summer of 2020. Absolutely. Well, I look forward to that. That's exciting. I, uh, I do enjoy the old Riddick movies. They are, they are fantastic uh, fun and some fantastic stories as well. So I'm excited for that. I'm excited for that. David, thank yeah. you so, so much for your, for your time today. Uh, I haven't have taken up too much of your time. Um, absolute pleasure talking to you and, uh, and good luck with everything and uh, good luck with number four. Hopefully it comes to pass. Thank you for everything, Scott. No worries, thank you. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey!